I think um, most Christians take their relationship with Christ rather casually. Um, you probably are the exception to this rule, but uh, generally I find, uh, and I think back in my life, and, and perhaps even now, there are many aspects of my relationship with God that um, I don't take as seriously as I do other areas of life. I think if you were asked the question, what are the most important things in your life? What would you say? Is, you know, would you, I think some of us would say, oh, God is most important, and then my family, and then whatever, my job, or something like that. But is God really what is most important? And the reason why I raise this you know, casual issue is because the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning is an extremely intense passage. And, um, and, and as such, because we don't normally think of our relationship with Christ as intense as you're going to see in the passage that we're looking at, uh, I think it's just difficult for us to just to engage with this. Now, there's going to be four things, and, and, and uh, I, I'd want to start off with these four things that are issues that are going to come up in this passage that are fundamental ideas in Christianity, in our relationship with Christ. And, and those four you can see here, the idea of growing spiritually, the idea of, of threats to our spiritual well-being, the idea of perseverance in the Christian life, and the idea of discipleship. So let me ask you a few questions regarding each of these four areas. The first, let's start off with growth. If I was to sit down and ask you the question, are you growing spiritually? Are you getting stronger or weaker in your relationship with God? Are you growing closer to God? Would you know how to respond to those questions? I probably wouldn't even ask you those questions, or have any, has anyone ever asked you those questions? Because we consider it, I don't know, private, or we really don't know, and, but we might uh, very might well sit down with some kind of financial counselor and be able to ask and know in great detail whether our portfolio, whether our investments, whether our accounts are going up or down, how we're doing, is it stronger or weaker, or getting closer to God, or getting closer to our retirement goals, or whatever it is we're saying for. We can answer those questions physically in our life, financially in our lives, but not often relationally. But what about with God? So we, we wouldn't outright reject the idea of spiritual growth or that these questions are, could be important, but our attitude toward them more is, is casual. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, I think I'm growing spiritually. I don't really know. I think maybe, I hope I'm glow, growing closer to God. Maybe it's more likely that we know that we're not growing or that we're moving away from God. But I, again, I'd casual, I would characterize, our, our, if we even think about spiritual growth, as a rather casual attitude toward it. How about threats to your spiritual well-being? If I asked you, are there any spiritual threats that you're facing, that you feel? Are you more concerned about threats to your body or to your soul? Now, we know with COVID, there's been this real emphasis, right, on people concerned about their physical well-being. I'm not minimizing that, but am I as concerned about my spiritual well-being as I am about my physical well-being? Think about all the precautions we take, all the measures, steps, how we've changed our lives, in order to deal with a threat to our physical well-being. 
But do we do anything like that for threats to our spiritual well-being? A couple of times Jesus said, you know, tried to emphasize the, uh, the importance of the spiritual in relation to the physical. For example, when he said, do not fear the one who can destroy your body, but fear the one who has your soul. <laughs> You should fear him more than you should physical persecution. Or how about when he said, in rather graphic and horrific language, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Again, isn't it stark language and imagery to use? And what was the point that Jesus was making? It's really kind of like a slap into the face, a slap in the face to get our attention that our spiritual well-being is more important than our physical well-being. But our attitude tends to be rather casual toward any spiritual threats. How about the idea of perseverance? You know, of course, that Paul likens, we and just recently uh, brought up the, I brought up this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul likens this, our, our Christian life to a race, an Olympic race. And he says in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get that prize. Uh, an athlete who's going to the Olympics goes into strict training to get that prize. You know, I do likewise. So are you, are you, when you think of your relationship with God as a race, are you running in such a way as to win that race? What does winning look like? And if I don't win the race, what do I stand to lose? Or what do I stand to gain? Paul says we run to get a crown that will last forever. In the Olympics, they run to get a gold medal that will not last. But we run to get a, a crown that will last forever, an award that will last. What is he talking about? What do I stand to gain? But see, the way we, we have tend to think about the Christian life and our relationship with God, we don't think about it in terms of a race and having to, you know, we, we tend to think of it more as a single transaction. When I was uh, born, you know, shortly after I was born, I was baptized as a baby. That, that brought me into the covenant according to Lutheran theology. And then I was confirmed, that was confirmed, supposedly, <laughs> when I was, whatever, 13, 12 or 13. Okay, so now what? Well, now you're in, now you're good. Well, you should probably grow to church, you know, or whatever, but, but I could have done a, not a lick of anything not cared one lick about God, come to the end of my life and die, and the, the pastor or whoever would have done the funeral said, well, he was baptized. Or in a more evangelical sense, we'd say, well, he's, he's prayed to receive Christ as his Savior. That's all that matters. He got in. That's the most important thing. So the idea of perseverance, <laughs> we don't need nowhere to fit that. I'm, I'm good, I'm in. How many people have I talked to spiritually? Talk to them about their spiritual well It's all, well, relax, I'm in. I'm good, <laughs> you know? Dave, if you want to, you know, get into this and press and run and try or whatever, hey, good for you. But that's not me. You know, I, I mentioned once before, I remember talking to somebody about the Christian life like this. And them saying to me, you know, they, they said, you know, I read in a book that um, the Christian life is kind of like a cruise ship. And there's some people who are up on the deck of the cruise ship just enjoying the view and the sea breeze and just, you know, 
having a good old time. Now there are some others on the cruise ship who are down like in the engine room and they're shoveling coal or whatever. They're, they're concerned about how the ship is working and what's going on and you know what all of these details. And so Dave, you're like one of those guys down in the engine room. But I'm like one of those people up on the deck. So go ahead, you know, but I'm just gonna enjoy the breeze and enjoy the ride. Is that? See? So, uh, you know, uh, so it's hard to have a, you know, uh, a concern about persevering when we have these, we've kind of been informally discipled in this kind of Christianity, and, and we make some connections there, like, well, if I, if I believed in Jesus when I was 15, and I can't ever lose my salvation, so I guess it doesn't matter how I live my life. Or if I, because I was baptized or confirmed, I guess it, you know, we, we're never, we don't, you know, outright say it doesn't matter how we live, but that's how we live. Like just get on with life and God is there to help me have a better life. So again, the idea of perseverance is it's just something I, I don't know what to do with. The last is just discipleship. And by that, I mean, I mean being engaged in a significant way with other people for the purpose of growing spiritually. Being engaged in a significant way with other Christians for the purpose of growing spiritually. So that, that can be, and often is, or it would be good, you know, if that was one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. But it is unlikely that that, well, that is unlikely that that is happening if you just come on Sunday morning. Because you can listen to me, and to some degree I ho hope you get to know me, so if you know me, then what I say is more incarnational in truth than just if you had no clue who I am, then I'm just giving a good teaching. But, but, but the idea of, of I, I, I want to interact with other Christians and talk about growing in my relationship with God and helping others to do that. Um, that is something that we know goes on very rarely in the Christian life. Um, for example, if I asked you, when you became a Christian, were you ever discipled? Now, again, I want to allow for discipleship on many different levels. So you would hope if you when you were growing up, you went to Sunday school. That is a form of discipleship. And maybe you were engaged in Bible studies or other things, but you never actually, no one actually said, uh, Veronica, I want to disciple you. Meet with me on a regular basis. I'm going to disciple you. I mean, that, I think that is, is what God would like, you know, that God intends but so rarely happens. For example, if you ask me, did anyone ever disciple me? The answer is no. No. I became a Christian and I just tried to find my own way. So I grew up going to church. I became a Christian when I was 19. So I, I knew, well, I should probably go to church. Started going to a church and I started reading the Bible on my own. And I was discipled, I guess, in a way. You know how I was discipled? I was discipled informally. If you aren't discipled formally, you certainly will be discipled informally. And by that I mean, you look at the other people around you who claim to be Christians, and you figure that's how you do it. That's what the Christian life looks like. So, you know, I started going to this church. Well, first I went to a church that, you know, um, frankly, I just think most of the people there probably were not Christians. They were just doing religious duty. And I got a, you know, a, 
a five minute like homily thing for a sermon and I did my religious duty and, and left. And everybody that's, you know, but then I started going to, a, you know, a more evangelical church. And so then I started to learn certain things about how to live the Christian life. Like back then, you always carry a Bible to church. Whether you read it or not doesn't, you know, I don't know about that, but you always carry a Bible when you go to church. You always dress a certain way. You always sit in a certain seat. We never really talk much about spiritual things, but you talk about, you know, hey, you're playing softball. Involvement in the church is getting on the church softball team or going to a picnic. I remember, as I told you before, too, I'm going too long on this, but I remember uh, very clearly uh, going to a church and pulling out a, a church envelope and, and uh, seeing this word on there, tithe, except I didn't know what it, I had never seen it before. So I said to the person next to me, I said, what's a tithe? What's this word tithe? I've never heard of that before. Oh, that's tithe. It's so funny that you say that. Okay, so what does that mean? Oh, that means 10%. You see, you're supposed to, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to give 10%. Off your net or your gross. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to give 10%. Oh, no one ever told me that rule. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll start giving a tithe. Because that's what Christians do. Back then they had church on Sunday evenings. And I used to go, and, and Sunday evenings were, were more like a testimonial service. And, you, and hymn requests. So you could request a hymn. Oh, I want to sing, you know, Ferris Lord Jesus. And then we would sing that. Anybody have something they'd like to share? And people would get up and give testimonies. Oh, you know, this week at school, you know, I got to witness to somebody or I fell off the bus and broke my leg, you know, pray that my, <laughs> whatever, you know, all sorts of things. And I was a fairly new Christian, so I'd get up every week and I would say something. Oh, this or that. I was reading in the Bible, this or that. God really spoke to me about this or that. And I began to notice the older, more mature Christians who would just kind of nod and elbow each other and say something like, isn't that cute? Isn't that cute? He's a new Christian. <laughs> He's really on fire for the Lord. And then I remember a, a Christian, uh, a, a young woman, and I was talking to her about something, and, and she said to me, she said, and I, and I said, oh, she had been to Bible college, and you know, she'd been a Christian a long time, and, and she said to me, she said to me, she said, you know, Dave, you're a new Christian, and you're really excited about everything, but I want to tell you, that's going to burn off. That's going to go away. And you're going you're to just settle down. It's cute that you're like this now. I thought, wow. And she wasn't the only one who said that to me. I thought, how pathetic. How sad. Shouldn't it get more exciting the more you get to know God? Not less exciting? So... So, you know, our attitude, uh, this is casual towards growth. And so, uh, you know, uh, when uh, maybe you've, I don't know if you, how familiar you are with these topics. But I, for a lot of Christians, if they came to church this morning they, and they heard somebody, this, this sermon would probably not go very far on the internet. A lot of, not a lot of interest in growth, threats, perseverance or discipleship. It's not, those aren't, because they're not real relevant to our lives as Christians or as people. Dave's interested in those things because like he goes off on those things. I don't know, because he's a pastor, you know, but we don't care about those things. Why isn't it relevant to us? Why is it so casual?
So now let, let me take you to Acts chapter 20 with all that build up. And, and, and one of the, the two things that I want you to see is the intensity of, of Paul and what the, how seriously they take God and their relationship with God and the gospel. And the second thing I want you to think about is, and, and this is where we're going to point out, the existence of and the importance of truth. Okay, let's, let me uh, show you this passage. Uh, I'm going to just a little summarize the, the first part. It's really 17 to 31, but we're going to focus on 25 to 31. But if you remember the way this starts out, here, here is Paul. Paul has been on various missionary journeys uh, in, in the Middle East, Southern Asia. And, and so um, w- one of those missionary journeys, he started, he founded the church in Ephesus. And it appears that it was in Ephesus that he spent the most amount of time. Uh, he says in the passage, we're going to say, I was with you three years. It appears from the text he was there two years. And then on and off. So I think in his mind, he sees it as, I was significantly engaged with you for three years. But it's the most of any one place. So here, now he's, 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 he's kind of done, he's on his last missionary journey, he's going to go to Jerusalem. And you'll see here shortly, because he believes that the Holy Spirit is leading him to go to Jerusalem, where he is certainly going to suffer. And, uh, and his people, like the Ephesians, they know this also. This is bad. Don't do this, Paul. Paul wants to talk to the Ephesian elders one last time. He spent three years with them. What is he going to say? So he calls the elders to Miletus because he's on his way to Jerusalem. He decides he doesn't want to detour to Ephesus. It'll take a little bit more time, and he's eager to go to Jerusalem. Hence, he says here, Paul sent for the Ephesian elders of the church to come to him. And here's the things that he says. Again, if if we had more time, I would just say, let's just pause, and I, I, I really want you to think about it, maybe jot down some things on paper. What would you expect Paul to say to the elders? I think he would say something like, we had a wonderful time together. I love you. you got a great future ahead. You know, Love the Lord. Serve him. Great things are happening. The gospel is being spread. Be involved in that. You know, the, that what he, that's what he might say. So let's see what he says. So he goes on and he says this. You know how I lived. And uh, if you've been here previously, you know how I love that. <laughs> that little phrase. You know how I lived. He did not just preach to them in words, but he lived it. You know, you know how I lived, I, how I served the Lord in the midst of severe testing, persecution. I remained faithful to him. I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. In other words, like I might feel like this Sunday, oh, I don't want to talk about perseverance and threats to our spiritual and nobody's interested in that it's a hot summer day or almost summer you know come on well, how about some lemonade serve up some lemonade iced lemonade something sweet something short something a little inspirational that's what we need but Paul says I, I didn't give in to that temptation I didn't hesitate to tell you what I knew to be what was good for you, and that I declared to both Jews and Greeks, not showing any respecter of person, serving the Lord faithfully, telling them 
You must turn to God, repent and believe in Jesus Christ. And now, compelled by the Spirit, he tells them, I'm going to Jerusalem. And I know, he says, the Holy Spirit makes clear to me that wherever I go, not just Jerusalem, but wherever I go, I am going to suffer imprisonments and hardships. I am going to be persecuted. However, he says, there's nothing more important in life or in death than to serve the Lord faithfully, complete the task, the race, that he has set me on, that he has given me, the task of testifying to the grace of God through a faith relationship in Jesus Christ. Okay, now let's pick up in verse 25, and let me just read those verses specifically to you. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, so because I know that we will never see each other again, these are the words I want to leave with you. Now again, I want you to think about this. He spent three years there, the Apostle Paul, teaching them, living with them, being example to them. Now he says, I know I will never see you again. This is what I want to say to you. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Remember, he's writing to the, he's, he's talking with the elders. Your overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning you, warning each of you, night and day with tears. Let me just remind you of the intensity of the language he uses if you... You can't miss it. But remember how I started, how we can take a very casual view of things. And you see how contrary it is that what we see expressed here in what Paul says. I am innocent of the blood of any of you. Now, of course, he's not talking about the physical life, but this, their spiritual well-being. And having a sense of, of responsibility for what is more important than their lives themselves, than their lives, their physical lives, their spiritual well-being. And the reason that he's into, uh, innocent of their blood is because he has not hesitated to preach to them the whole will of God. After I leave savage wolves will come in among you. Isn't that amazing? Paul, didn't you like disciple them and make them strong? And, you know, again, I, as I said earlier, I think if, if I was thinking, well, what would this elder, what would Paul say to them? He would probably say, you got a good base going. Great things are going to happen. This church is going to grow. You know, be encouraged. A positive message or something. But instead, he says, like, just the opposite. I, I think, again, if, if you put yourself in, in the position of one of these elders, no, maybe they wouldn't be surprised. Because when you look at almost every, or I'm willing to say, every one of the epistles in the New Testament, 
Each of the letters Paul wrote, but not only Paul, John and Peter, every one of them is addressing the issue of a, of a threat to the church. So maybe the elders were very familiar with that. And Paul is just reminding them, this is, this is not a game. This is not something to be taken casually. Savage wolves will come in among you. <laughs> Notice the threat. The concern is not like, hey, those Romans, those Pharisees, they're going to, you better watch out. They're going to arrest you. They're going to they're gonna kill some of you. They're going to persecute you. You stay away from them. Watch out. They're coming. No, that's not the concern. That's kind of a given. And that is less of a threat than what is coming here in these savage wolves which come from within. They will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. For three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock. Be shepherds of the church of God. So be on your guard. <laughs> you see how, again, let me emphasize how different when I, when I started off and said, you know, most of us think of pretty casually toward our relationship with God, toward Christianity. And then we have this. Look out, I've warned you, tears day and night. The wolves are coming, savage wolves are coming. And the issue in, all around this is, well, let me, let, I, let, I guess, lead into this. So he says, savage wolves among you, not from outside. And the key is, they are going to distort the truth. Distort the truth. Now, I, I, well, truth matters. Truth matters. Notice he didn't say, well, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, I don't know, whatever else. Notice he didn't say they're going to deny the truth. That certainly happened, but he's not saying that here. They are going to distort the truth. And there are going to be those who will follow them. And that is the goal. And we're going to talk about this in just a minute. But I want you to see, the truth leads, what you believe leads to behavior. <laughs> they will distort the truth in order to draw off or draw away disciples after them. Not believers, but people who follow their way. Okay, so let, let me talk about truth a little bit. And again, it, you know, if I was sitting where you were, I'd say, well, I don't really care. This is philosophical. Who, you know, what, whatever. <laughs> you know, I'm not, again, you know, hello, Dave, serve us up some lemonade. It's getting hotter by the minute. <laughs> you know, can we, truth, well, let's talk about truth. Who, who cares about truth? <laughs> you know, well, all of that is just to show you what a dangerous position we are in. Because what I'm talking about is not philosophical. Yesterday, for example, I was in Panera working, and I noticed that there was some, you know, they play background music, and there's some whatever pop song, maybe some of you know what it is, I must, it must be popular because it's on their whatever, their little soundtrack. But, um, but I noticed that um, the, the singer is saying something about living your truth. Your truth is something that was repeated in this song. Your truth, living your truth, I don't know, whatever, something about your truth. Now, see, that's the culture we live in. 
It is very popular. I interact with a number. I'm telling you, if you haven't incur, encountered this, it is saturating our culture. The idea now of your truth. And that could be like in this song, like, oh, that means being true to yourself, finding your own meaning in life. It's your truth. But it is a... Uh, I mean, it is a bastardization. It is a corruption of the word truth, of the concept we're talking about. And it is reinforcing, and I'm telling you, this is such a pervasive attitude in Christianity. Because it is in our culture. Truth really doesn't exist, it's all relative. And I, you know, I just had some conversations with people. Said, oh, did you read this book? What is this book? Oh, well, it's about, it's about black theology. You see, it's seeing, it's seeing Christianity from a black perspective. Oh, here's another book. Did you read this one? Oh, this one is seeing theology. They use the word theology. Uh, from a female perspective. Because the Bible is so misogynistic. It's, it's all men, 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 men. <laughs> you know? It's distorted. So we have these different theologies, even within Christianity. And, and, and you know, I was talking with somebody, and they say, oh, well, in our Bible study, we're looking at different theologies. Was well, there anything wrong with that? No, there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, to get a little technical here, you know, in, in seminary, or the correct way to handle the scriptures, I thought, is where you say, what does the text say? What does the text say? When Paul says, savage wolves are going to come in among you, the issue is not whether I'm black or female or, or Italian or whatever, Polish or who, whatever culture, because I'm not supposed to read into the text what I think it means. The term for that is eisegesis. But I'm supposed to exegete that. I'm supposed to say, what was Paul saying in his context, at his time? Oh, well, he was a male. Yes, he was. <laughs> And we should understand that. But that's the issue is, what does the text say? What was Paul saying? Then there are applications of that, and perhaps interpretations of that. But there aren't different truths. But you see, when now today, when people say, well, there's this theology and there's that theology, and in our, oh, a lot of other people have different opinions, it reinforces in a relativistic society where there is no real truth that you see, nobody really knows anything. It's just whatever slant or whatever you want to believe, just like in politics and other areas of life. Oh, Republicans believe that, Democrats believe that, conservatives believe that. Uh, liberals believe that and they all think they're right they all think they've got it right and so we come to a place that the what the term used to mean truth has to be modified with absolute truth so the first thing I want you to see here is truth exists because Paul says some are going to come and distort it. And if it's being distorted, it means that there is some accurate truth. There's some undistorted truth, right? That exists. And it has specific content. Because Paul preaches it, teaches it, declares it, testifies, proclaims it. Which means you must hear this truth. It doesn't come by osmosis. You must be taught or told this truth. So Paul says, I've been given the task of what? Of testifying to the good news of God's grace. 
I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God, repent, and believe in Jesus Christ or experience the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm innocent of the blood of any of you. Why? Because I have not hesitated to preach to you the whole will of God. I have not hesitated to tell you the whole will of God. So I, and, well, I think I have, well, so the role of overseers and shepherds is what? Is to, is to tell the truth. Is to teach the truth. Because it exists. But people must be told and taught. Here, Paul in, in Romans 10 writes, it, it just makes sense. This is just reasonable. This is nothing spiritual. How can they call on one like Jesus? How can they believe in Jesus? How can they call on one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone telling them, preaching to them? Consequently, faith comes by hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. So truth exists. And secondly, truth can be known. As I just said to you, again, we, you know, when I, I interact with people and I say, well, you know, what do you believe about God? Or are you a Christian or whatever? Well, let me tell you. Now, I used to think, and this is going to sound a little bit arrogant, but, you know, okay, I was trained as an engineer, and I've said this story before. Um, you know, I, initially when I was hired, I was in a drafting department, and I had to do this drawing, and there was a perspective of this piece of this tool and I was certain that I had done this drawing correctly and I took it over to this woman who was not an engineer like me and uh, but who was had been a draftswoman for you know 30 years I showed her the drawing she said well you you got that perspective wrong you see this this and that I said no I don't <laughs> no I have it right and she said no you have it wrong and I, I must have thought, I, I'm an engineer, okay? You are just a drafts person. She's been doing this for 30 years. I've been doing this for 30 hours, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I should have said, well, you know, maybe she knows better. Now, so this is the arrogant part. So I go to Panera or whatever. I've been in the ministry, whatever, 35 years. Or I've been a Christian, whatever, um, uh, over 40 years. I've been to seminary. I thought a lot about a lot of things or whatever. Do you think I get any credit for that from somebody? Like, oh, Dave, maybe he knows a little bit more than we do. Not one lick. We all know what's best. And you go to Bible study, right? Oh, Martin Luther said this, or John Wesley said, I don't care about that. What does it mean to you? You are the authority. You know what's best. Everyone does what is right in his own eyes. And even just talking about it sounds like wrong to us. You know, like, you got, you got to be careful about people who are pastors. You got to be careful about institutions. You got to be careful about history. You got to be careful about these old guys. You better trust yourself. That's, that's the only one you can really trust. And so we, truth can't be known because it's your truth. <laughs> it's whatever you think it is. But I want you to see here, truth can be known. I have not hesitated to proclaim to you, isn't it fascinating that he would say, the whole will of God. Now, of course, he didn't mean exhaustively the whole will of God. We don't know everything about God. There's many things that are mysterious. But what he says is, I've not left things out that I didn't think you, would, you wouldn't like or wouldn't be popular. I gave you the whole truth. 
And what is going to happen with these savage wolves, these false, they give you part of the truth. They keep away the unpopular things to your own detriment, but to their good. But I've not done that. But you see, it, it, it can be known. He, Paul can teach it, and they can know it. Men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples, i.e., don't give in to that. Don't succumb to that because you can know the truth. Because I gave you the truth. And you should recognize that as a distortion. A verse we've not read, but verse 32, the next one is, Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified, those who are set apart to God. But see, I want you to see, he, he then goes on to say, But I... I'm not in total despair. You have everything you need to remain faithful. Just beware. Be careful. Stay close. It's coming. These threats are coming. So it exists. It can be known. It must be obeyed. Obeyed. That's, you know... I was just in a discussion and it went right away to something about theology. And you know, after that conversation, I thought to myself, you see, Dave, you know, the, the word theology, so quickly Christianity becomes information and theology. Let's talk about theology. Let's talk about doctrine. What do you believe? And those are tick points. You know, I believe these, these things. And that's, that's what begins to characterize your relationship with God. Information. And we're in a culture that has, and then, and then in a Christianity, because it's, uh, Christianity becomes enculturated, that loves information and access to information, but does nothing with it. What were we just talking about? You know, we're in a trivial society. What did I, I just heard, uh, you know, it, it's fascinating to me. I listened to the BBC. So that's where sophisticated, intelligent people get their news from, the BBC. So I do that. I get my news from the BBC. So I have this thing, you know, where I can get a five minute news summary because that's all you need to do. That's all you need is five minutes to know everything that's going on in the world. And that's all the time I have. Then I'm a well-informed person because I've listened to five minutes of news on the BBC. Um, but the BBC, fascinating to me, that they, they, they always, or almost always, end their five-minute newscast with some bit of trivial trash, which is fascinating to me because I have four stories. You know, the war in Syria, people, you know, Russia and Crimea, People dying of disease, the, the wipeout of, of COVID, you know, in India. Oh, and by the way, you know, uh, what was the one they had the other day that I, you know, like it was Bob Dylan's 80th birthday or, you know, even more very trivial things. Why do you do that? And even with the news, what, what, did, what effect did any of that have on me? This is where we, we have to be super careful. We come into the Christian, we read a devotional every day, we listen to the, you know, even Christian music and all this stuff, and we never do anything with it. Hello, that is dangerous. <laughs> Jesus was always saying, to those who have ears, let them hear. What was he saying when he said that? Obviously, he wasn't talking about audibly. It was, you better do something with this. Truth is always demands a, either a rejection or a faith response. And it is always transformative. Like Paul said, you know, you, you know how I lived. You know how I lived. 
How we live is what we believe. They distort the truth in order to draw away disciples. Disciples whose lives are changed to adjust to the distorted truth. And then last, let me, I'll just finish with this. Truth is always personal. This is where I want to go back to the theology thing. Talking with these people, talking about theology, you talk about it as if it's information. You know, when, when, when we sing and when, here I'm reading, uh, so I was reading last night a book, The Attributes of God by Charnak. He's from the, he was born in the 1600s and, you know, it, When you read a book about the attributes of God, or we sing these hymns with all these phrases about the greatness of God, does it just become information to us? And theology to us? And not personal? And it's not obeyed. And, and obeyed means like, when you read up there, uh, you know, Oh, God, beyond all, uh, you know, pray. He's so incredible. I, I, I just constantly say to this, how can I sing these things about the greatness of God? And I go, oh, I wonder what's for lunch. <laughs> I'm tired. How many of these are we going to sing, Rick? Like, huh, come on. Really? But I, my heart and my mind keep slipping into that. Another hymn, another chorus, run it through, sit down, listen to the sermon, get up, leave. It just becomes information. And, 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 and with theology, it's always personal. You should write that down somewhere. It's always personal. You owe, I am never talking about God. That was, as someone I read pointed out, Satan in the garden talked about God. Did God say this? Did God do this? He talked about God. Notice Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross talked to God. It is always personal. I, always, I want to try and remember that again. Whenever I talk about spiritual things or theology, and it can quickly go to these, you know, social and theological issues. What about women in ministry? What about racism in Christianity? What, and, it, and it becomes, it, it quickly moves from the personal. I'm not trying to be reductionistic here. But there is always an important, remember, it is always about Christ. And he is a person. God is personal. So I'll just finish with this. Here, now, here in, in Revelation chapter 2, um, Paul is, I, I'm sorry, John is writing probably uh, 30 years after this conversation, you know, this conversation between Paul and these Ephesian elders, you know, is happening, um, well, it, you know, Acts is, is maybe in the early 60s, 30, 40 years later, what we're reading about in Revelation. So the church is, what has happened to the church at Ephesus? And the church at Ephesus is one of the churches addressed in John's Revelation. So in chapter 2, interestingly, what does it say about the church in Ephesus? So here we have in 20 the warning that Paul gives. So how did it go? So this is what it says. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. Sounds good. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. Just like Paul warned them. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now, there is, that's all the positive. 
And that's a lot of positive, isn't it? I mean, what could be negative? And here's what could be negative. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You have forsaken the love you had at first. I don't think he's talking about love between one another. I think he's talking about their devotional love for Christ. And I want you to notice it doesn't say you have lost, as the King James Version, you have lost your first love because lost is like I lose my keys accidentally. Forsaken, the word used here is I intentionally moved away. To lose your keys, they fall out of your pockets without you knowing. To forsake them is for you to take your keys and throw them across the parking lot. They were, they persevered. You see, they were, they were great Christians, except they had lost their first love, that personal relationship with Christ. He is a person. We're not following a religion. We're in love with a God. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Second, or Revelation 2, 1 through 5. Okay, so how do I respond here? Well, this is what I would say to you. Keep watch. Do you think it's more dangerous for us now, or was it more dangerous for the Ephesians? Do you think they face more threats, or do you face more threats? Well, my tendency, I, I, I think I want to say it's more dangerous today. You know, there were just a small group of, of, of believers, probably just one church in Ephesus. So if you wanted to follow some, if you wanted to kind of not be a Christian anymore or go off and follow something else, there wasn't another church that you could just run down the street to. I don't know, it, we're not clear whether these false teachers then broke away and started false churches. But we live in a day and age, you don't like what I say? A hundred more churches you could go to. In fact, why even go to a church? Just flip your channel or go on the internet. I guarantee you, whatever kooky thing you want to believe, you can find somebody who believes it, who preaches it, and has followers. So I would just say our exposure to false, distorted truth is much greater, much, much greater than it was for the Ephesians. Uh, the second thing is, is, is uh, that I would say is, as a Christian, I'd say, you should submit to teaching. It's, it's hard for me to say that because I even feel the effect of my culture. And, and I feel it too. It's like, I don't, I don't need to listen to anybody else. I've got my own Bible. I check things out on the internet. I decide for myself. I mean, I, I like some things that this guy says, and I like some things that this woman says, and I like some things in that book. But I'm not going to trust any one of those. It just seems to me that you should be in some kind of body, we'll just call it a body, or a church, where you have some kind of significant interaction with other Christians, mature Christians, where we hold each other accountable and we say, let's watch out. <laughs> you know? There's a lot of danger out there. I need protection. I need help. But that's not in vogue today. And maybe, maybe that's fallen out. Now you can do it yourself.
Back in the Ephesians, they had no choice. They didn't have internet and all this other stuff. Now you do have that, so you don't need overseers and elders anymore. Uh, and then the last is, uh, you could trust God. Obviously, we need to be diligent, beware, as Paul said. But at the same time, sometimes I get into discussions with people and I just feel overwhelmed. I just feel overwhelmed and I start to think, God, maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I don't know the truth. I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're right. I, I just feel very unstable. I feel very shaken sometimes. And I begin to feel like maybe we can't know the truth. Maybe I don't know. Maybe God doesn't even exist. And, and it's very, and I just find it very unsettling. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but I'm telling you, I do. And, and I want you to see, though, that you can come back to and say, but I can trust God. Jesus, you said you would send the Holy Spirit who will lead us into all truth. I, I'm trusting that you'll do that. And so I'm not being arrogant in that. I'm being really broken before God and casting myself on him and saying, I need you, O oh God, and I trust you. Trust you is not just desperation coming to God. Trust is you will take care of me. So this is how Paul ends in verse 26. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Or Gene Peterson's translation, now I'm turning you over to God, our marvelous God, whose gracious word can make you into what he wants you to be and give you everything you could possibly need in this community of holy friends.